Robert, we've done three different discussions on the subject. So some people might be hearing this for the third time or the fourth. Some people might be hearing this for the third time at the very least because we were on with, um, ugh, who are we on with, Robert? Robert? Grueler on Friday. Uh, I did a bit with uh, Matt Christensen and Blondie, which is going to be in their live stream tonight where I discussed this. So it feels like the third or multiple time that we've been talking about it, but it is going to be the first for our audience. So, uh, I mean, let's let's get into the verdict itself. Everyone has been up to speed on the trial. We have been covering this uh, in you know sufficient detail every Sunday. Robert Gruel has been covering it every day. Three and a half week trial. They go into deliberation the day after Maxine Waters issues what can only be described as an implicit, if not an explicit, threat of, what was the word she used? Confrontation in the event that there's not, uh, you know, the maximum conviction. She wanted first degree murder, which wasn't even on the table, suggesting that even if there was a conviction on the a felony murder, that it would still be, you know, deserving of more confrontation in the streets. They deliberate sequestered for 10 hours, come back with guilty across the board on all three charges. I know what you think about it. I think everyone out there knows what you think about it, but let's hear it. What do you think about it? So, I mean, I think it reflects the problems with uh, with having a trial in that particular venue. So it, it, it's also revelatory, hopefully, to some lawyers and probably revelatory in ways good and bad for a large part of the audience and people watching which is that it uh, sort of destabilized uh, believability and trust and confidence in the jury system itself. And, but this is the reality of how jurors are about, you know, more often than not, jurors come in, have already made up their mind, whether they themselves are, cogn uh, are conscious uh, of that or cognizant of it, uh, by the time they sit down, uh, they come in with presumptions and assumptions that are going to filter and frame the evidence in a particular way. And if this had been a conscientious jury, then what you, you the to have a quick jury verdict should always be acquittals uh, if if they're in fact a conscientious jury because the for the burden of proof is on the government the, that's the highest burden of proof known to man beyond a reasonable doubt there are multiple elements you have to get through to convict but there's only one element you have to get to for to acquit so it makes sense like OJ jury came back quickly because if you believe not guilty on some aspect then that's it. And here you could say not guilty because of reasonable force. You could say not guilty because of causation. You could say not guilty because of intent. Uh, you could reach any one of those three and say, okay, that resolves it. To uh, to get to a guilty verdict this quickly is, again, revelatory about the weaknesses in the jury system and, in, and the way humans make decisions in general. This, this is what I said, you know, from the beginning, I guess, when once it came down. 10-hour deliberation, I mean, it's not even one day. 10 hours is sort of almost uh, a lofty way of, of describing the length that they deliberated. It was out on Monday. The, the conviction was, was announced Tuesday at 5 o'clock. There was very, you know, virtually seemingly no consideration, or at the very least no appearance of consideration that went into the conviction, because I, I know a lot of people think it was darn obvious. You had it on video, et cetera, et cetera. Bear in mind that the three charges themselves it almost took the judge more time to read the criteria for a conviction on the three charges than they took in deliberation. These were like multi-pronged uh, levels of evidence in order to get to the convictions, especially on the felony murder. Um, so you know, when I heard that it, you know they were announcing it the next day, I was like, oh, maybe they were actually convinced that the excessive force element had not been met, which therefore allowed all three charges to drop because maybe they were convinced by Nelson's argument that Chauvin could have used more force, even by the expert's own uh, testimony, that the scene was sufficiently unsafe or felt unsafe, not just for Chauvin, who pulled the pepper spray when someone came around from behind him, UFC fighter, you know, giving him the eye in front of him. Even the EMS said they didn't feel comfortable administering first aid there and had to, had to move. So maybe they just felt that all of the conduct was not excessive force or at the very least justified police force to get to an acquittal on all three. And instead... Conviction on all three, no questions to the judge, no asking to read back evidence, no inquiries as to you know certain considerations. Uh, I mean, I, I've never practiced criminal law. I've never had a jury, a jury trial, but I mean, how does that happen? Like Typically, when there's deliberations on a high-profile case, on a very intricate case, you get the jury coming in with questions, asking to reread the evidence? No? 
Well, I mean, if they're a conscientious jury, yes. Now, the reality is in America that it shows you how biased jurors tend to be, that uh, a quick jury is almost always an, a guilty verdict, and a not guilty jury is almost always takes their time. So it, it gives you a sense of how, that's why I always tell people that, you know, get up about beyond reasonable doubt and so forth. Practical reality is most jurors don't really apply beyond a reasonable doubt. If they think you're guilty by 51%, they're not going to say, well, that really doesn't meet the, no, no, they're, they're going to convict. So the, uh, that's the unfortunate reality of it. We just got to witness it on display. And as we talked about before the trial started, this case was as much the American justice system being on trial as Derek Chauvin being on trial. And unfortunately, the justice system badly failed in terms of the court of public opinion in certain aspects of those people who followed it and even around the world. It, it sort of, and I'm sure with police officers across the board, because uh, it, it, what they, they have a right to ask questions to the, to the judge about any uh, aspects of law or evidence. They have the right to have evidence read back to them. They have the right to ask for evidence to be produced to them if there's some questions or doubt. And you'll see this with not guilty verdicts. Not guilty verdicts, you'll often see as Zimmerman, as an example, that's a comparable kind of case, multiple jury questions, multiple requests for evidence. Uh, they usually take at least a week. I mean, here you had a three-week trial with very complex factual evidence on causation, very complex factual evidence on reasonable force, uh, to some degree complex evidence about intent. You had 25 minutes of video, most of which they had not seen until the trial. Some of which they hadn't even seen during the trial. They never even apparently looked at all of it ever, uh, you know, other than what the, the the bits that were shown by the defense in close. Uh, and so it's a sign of a jury that made up their mind before they sat down and that you can have questions as to. And it appears that they lost this case in the court of public opinion, that they, they because of the media gaslighting a, a very simplistic singular narrative that failed to include exculpatory evidence or context. Uh, including expert context for reasonable force, context as to causation, context as to simply what led up to that last nine minutes, the 16 minutes beforehand. Uh, all of that uh, didn't matter because they had, for a year, this jury pool had been saturated in the government's prosecutorial press narrative. And what it is, it turns out you can't overcome that narrative. Uh, and they don't even pay attention to it. And here we got some revelatory insights. What we talked about before the trial was if it's a bad jury, it'd be a quick jury. And unfortunately, that's what came to fruition. But the alternate juror uh, yeah, interviews. Well, that's so that that was the next question. Someone asked in the super chat, will that alternate juror's testimony change anything, impact anything? I guess in, in order just to back it up a little bit, I mean, the alternate juror's testimony was that she felt pressure uh, to render a decision a certain way. It wasn't just pressure. It was they felt intimidated or pressured or threatened uh, in order to render a certain way because of what would ensue if they rendered it a certain way. And I mean, it, it goes without saying what that was. I guess the, the first question is chances of appeal, grounds of appeal, and whether or not this jurors, the alternate jurors, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Interview uh, is, is relevant, will change anything, or is, is a non-issue? Well, two things that stood out. One is it, it's what I call memento memory based on the movie Memento, which is fantastic. Classic. But it shows you how powerful motivated reasoning works when you uh, read her interviews. And she appears to be completely unaware of almost everything the defense presented in the case. <laughs> I mean, she said that, you know, that she didn't understand. She said the defense said, set out to prove stuff that they never proved. They set out they actually proved more than they set out to prove. So in the opening statement, uh, she said that she didn't understand why Floyd died over a $20 bill. How can you sit through three weeks of trial and still think that, that media story is true? Well, let me just say, I brought this up. Why does anyone care what the alternate juror thinks they weren't sitting on the jury? That's not that's not correct. The alternate juror heard the evidence. Oh, uh, yeah. The, this She sat through the entire jury. So she only was an alternate in terms of voting. But that that uh, everything else, she could have easily been one of the voting jurors. Uh, the fact that she wasn't a voting juror doesn't change the fact that she was one of the jurors who sat through the jury trial. And you're getting a glimpse into what all the other jurors thought by what she talked about and disclosed and discussed. And so you get the memento memory, the motivated reasoning. The, and this is what I often tell people. Trials are theater. Most lawyers spend tons of time on the trial. They think if I just win this cross-examination or... I just get this evidence in, or I set this up for closing, that that will help me win. That's simply not how human beings tend to operate. Uh, 70 to 80% of the time, <coughs> they made up their mind after opening statement. 
a lot of times over half the time before they've sat down, frankly. So the and if uh, and what and we saw clear evidence of that in what she discusses. So that aspect is not necessarily an appeal issue, the sense that, you know, this is the reality of jurors. And it's a reminder to all criminal defense lawyers out there that it is critically important. Jury selection is by far the most important thing you will do. And yet to this day, 90 percent of lawyers don't even employ a jury selection assistant in the jury selection process. Most of them uh, rely on cheap stereotypes and limited information and limited intel. Uh, it also appears that uh, they did not do, I'm guessing, meaningful focus groups, mock trials, and polling. Most This is true for 90% plus of defense lawyers. It, it is, it's just ludicrous. It's, frankly, it's borderline malpractice these days to, to not understand this is how the human brain works and to get out of the uh, mythology of how jurors make up their mind. We don't have blank slate human beings. This is That's a myth. It's a dangerous myth, a precarious myth that can harm both justice and for your client and for uh, the country as a whole and the justice system. So I think, you know, I encourage people to listen to her commentary and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about clearly revealed. Didn't know what the defense evidence was, still thought the core gaslit immediate narrative from the beginning was true. Uh, didn't, uh, and, but the revelatory part for, appeal or for the other three cop defendants, which somehow the media has forgot about, are facing trial in August. And this is why, you know, President Biden talking about this, his fraudulency, the second uh, Kamala Harris talking about this, uh, the governor talking about this, the mayor talking about this, uh, the that about Chauvin, they're going to all be on trial for the same thing in a few months. How in the world can that trial take place in Minneapolis after all of this? where the president of the United States has effectively announced them guilty by announcing Chauvin guilty. So the under these circumstances, that they should at least get their trial moved. But hopefully they'll also learn you need to do polling and survey evidence. You need to show the difference. You need to bring in psychological experts who can attest to the way, that, the way people work under bias and prejudice and pressure. Because her most revelatory point on that side of the aisle was her admission that she, uh, I, well, maybe I'll now call it the Greg uh, Gutfeld admission. Gutfeld got into some controversy. Oh, just yeah, for, for anybody who doesn't know what Greg Gutfeld said, now Crowder gave him a hard time, but Gutfeld basically said on the Fox 5 or whatever the friends are, uh, that he was glad that Chauvin got convicted, even if he didn't think he was necessarily guilty. Although, sorry, he said he was glad he got convicted, even if he were not guilty on all the charges, even though he thought he was guilty, because it spared rioting. And he was saying, I, I was in a neighborhood, my neighborhood got looted. I'm glad he got convicted because it's spared for the looting. I think he's guilty, but his statement was, I'm glad he got convicted, even if he were not guilty, although I think he was guilty because it's spared looting. I mean, it's it's the, he tried to back oh, his way out of it. I think he might have misspoken in a sense, but uh, taken flack for it, but I, he might have said the, the soft part out loud. I think he was just being honest. And that's what he said. He said, look, I'm just being honest. And I think it was good that he was honest. I don't have a problem with it. I know Crowder took some shots at him, but I thought th that he shouldn't have shots taken at him. He's saying what you can guarantee those jurors thought and what the alternate juror admitted she thought, which is that, you know, the she didn't want more riots to occur. She didn't want more looting to occur. She didn't want more problems to occurring. There was rioting occurring during the trial. To ask human beings to make a decision of, hey, do what uh, is right, really dig into the evidence, really consider it conscientiously, really try to figure out what the jury instructions are, ask questions where there's clarity, I have evidence read back to you, but do so at the risk of your community, do so at the risk to yourself, is maybe asking an unreasonable thing. And I think that that's what that juror sort of communicated. And, and this was, in my view, the most significant effect of the Chauvin verdict was it was a mob uh, it was mob justice and it was media gaslit justice. And that's a very dangerous thing for the justice system uh, in general. And so I think that's why paying attention to this case is significant beyond Derek Chauvin, who I'm not a particular admirer of. No, I mean, we, we, we know what we've said of Chauvin. We know what we believe of Chauvin. Uh, that being said, we have probably more thoroughly than 99.9% .9 of the people out there followed the actual trial and the evidence and came to determinations that might defy our own initial reaction and our own personal beliefs. The, but now, so, I mean, the issue is the jury was never sequestered during this entri entire trial. They know what's going on. They know there's literally riots, not outside the courthouse because it's a militarized zone, but there's riots in the city. Uh, they are not sequestered when Maxine Waters says, if we don't get a conviction on all three counts, we've got to get more confrontational. They are probably not unaware of the fact that 
a severed pig's head was found, was left on the steps of the former uh, house of one of the experts. And yeah, I mean, it's it is, it, asking people to do the difficult thing. And I brought up a couple of chats versus asking them to do the impossible. It, one super chat said, you know, I like to think I would have been the stubborn one who said, stick to my beliefs. This is what I believe. Someone else in the chat responded, it's not just you, it's family, friends, job, everything. It's, it's a virtual impossibility. And you, know, you deliberate for 10 hours after a three and a half week trial, which had, your, as, like you said, medical, issue, medical questions that were complex, causation questions that were complex, uh, excessive force questions that were complex, legal questions that were complex. The, the, the three charges, felony murder, a second degree felony murder, third degree depraved mind murder and manslaughter that came with a slew of legal criteria and conditions in order to be proven in the uh, judge's directions. 10 hours. Uh, it, it almost, in hindsight, now looks like the decision was deliberately made quickly to, to send a message. I mean, you can think he's guilty, but there, at the very least, I would say it cynically, feign uh, consideration. Spend a few days doing it. Don't come back the next day and say guilty across the board on all of these complex issues when everyone knows the immense threats and pressure, direct and indirect, that they are under. So, you know, if you're if 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 Chauvin is looking at an appeal, I suspect he is. What are going to be the grounds of the appeal? Uh, I guess in order of strength. I think that Chauvin has an exceptionally strong appeal. Now, I think that for Chauvin personally, there's not much hope because he faces tax charges that are ongoing, state and federal. He also, fa for not filing tax returns for many years, which probably means deeper corruption problems, as I've suggested before. And now the, the U.S. Department of Justice is investigating him for prior incidents. So they may, you know, they just, they're, they're just going to keep coming after him forever. So the, uh, uh, and I don't have a problem with that if it turns out he's guilty of prior incidents. The, as I said from the get-go, his long history raised red flags for me. But uh, the, so to me, the significance of this appeal isn't about Derek Chauvin or about George Floyd. Uh, this is about the justice system. And this what happened here was a travesty of justice. This was mob rule, not the, this was rule of the mob, not rule of law. And that's not something we can either because they were part of the mob or because they were in, afraid of the mob. And frankly, as we talked about the closing arguments discussion, this was the government's explicit pitch. Just remember the video you saw before you came in here and listen to the mob and do what they need. I mean, that was basically what they said, if you really paid attention to what the thematic structure of that closing argument was. So that's why it's deeply disturbing. He has highly, there's a bunch of, you know, would be commentators that are uh, highlighting the difficulty of filing criminal appeals, the difficulty of winning criminal appeals. Uh, in general, you know, Pope Hat is doing his usual spiel. Uh, you know, proves how useless he is. I mean, the, the inability of these people to make independent commentary because they suffer from variations of Trump derangement syndrome shows you should never hire or trust those people as your lawyer uh, because they're incapable of being independent of thought and they're too politically blinded to stay, can't, to actually care for the constitutional rights they pretend they care for. But in that context, they, uh, he's got exceptional grounds for appeal. Now, in general, yes, appeals are tough. And this is one of my criticisms of our criminal justice process, as we got to witness in this case. Years ago, political scientists got together and said, you know, we should have some objective metrics to measure totalitarian governments. They wanted a scientific tool to say, see, these countries are totalitarian and these countries are not. One of the things they came up with it was they noted that totalitarian countries, a hallmark of them, is very high conviction rates in their criminal justice process. Well, folks, the United States has a higher rate than most totalitarian governments do. So that should tell you how bad our criminal justice system operates. The simple risk of human error is too high for us to have conviction rates in the high 80s and low 90s. And it is true that most appeals go nowhere. The Court of Appeals look for excuses to rubber stamp what the government did. Our, our courts are, are continuously weak. They're filled with the Amy Coney Barretts of the world who, as long as they do the right thing, get fat checks like a $2 million check for a book that ain't going to sell a million copies. So there's nothing but that, but well, a payoff. The, the, go the government can buy them and distribute them to uh, you know uh, new arrivals, uh, which in, like in Kamala the- Like Kamala Harris. Like Kamala Harris. In, in the greatest form, what, what, what is that? That's not embezzlement. What, what would that be qualified as? For anyone who doesn't know, uh, the government is buying Kamala Harris's book to give to new arriving immigrants, I believe. Uh, in the States. And Kamala Harris says she didn't know about it. But wonderful that tax dollars are at work to buy. Conflict of interest is probably the word I was looking for. Tax dollars to buy the book of the current sitting vice president. Oh, and, 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 
it, go ahead, Simon, because it's, I have no words for it. But yeah, it's one of the easiest money laundering techniques out there. It's how it's how you can bribe people with these, and and you know speaking fees, board fees, and book fees. And I'll probably be doing a future uh, hush hush on uh, or deep state episode on the way some of these book publishers operate, uh, some of the people they paid off. And if you track some of the history of some of these publishers, they might have some interesting ancestral heritage to a certain part of the world, to a certain famous party. Uh, so, you know, that'll be on a at Viva Barnes Law dot locals dot com where you can find all that information. So uh, but in that outside of that context, uh, that does not there are uh, arguments that are much stronger than others. And here the court of public opinion, particularly in the legal world, uh, can make an influence on their understanding of the Chauvin trial being a, a disgrace of a trial and being very damning of the American criminal justice process and confidence in its in independence and integrity and impartiality, which is the constitutional requirement for a jury. First issue, unique issue he has. Usually appeals are tough also because all you're appealing is some small evidentiary ruling, something minor, something that's not legal, something that's really technical, something that requires they get dig into the weeds. Those are very difficult. And that's where most of them are. If you look at the appeals that win, they tend to be on questions of law, questions of le law about the jury instructions, questions of law about venue, questions of law about jury selection, questions of law about big pieces of evidence. He has all of those. Um, so first, there's the question of the felony murder statute itself. So, the, which yeah, so is now, yeah, just stop you there. That's a pure question of law, correct? I mean, it, it, there's oh, going yeah. to be pure question of law on the felony murder. Can it be interpreted to include as the underlying felony the assault itself? Um, because uh, I know someone, someone just said, it. explain to me, how, how does a man kill him? How does someone kill a man three times? There are three separate distinct charges. The sentencing will be cumulative and not uh, consecutive. So three technically different charges, the first of which is the felony murder and the question of law on appeal, which they reserved, uh, you know, before the trial even got started. Can the underlying felony itself be the assault that leads to the death as opposed to a distinct felony? So well, I think people's point that that they should have been making a decision between the charges and not just saying, yes, 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 raise questions about the jury's deliberation met, met, uh, method and about the law itself. So it's like, okay, which did he do? Did he intend to kill him? Did he not, did he not intend to, but was reckless? Uh, was he being reckless in general? Was he only being reckless towards him? Quite clearly, they didn't care about any of those questions by the, by the timing of their deliberations. And it does raise questions about all, you know, convicting on everything uh, in the manner that it was done, because theoretically you're deciding between the charges, not it's either this or this or this, not this and this and this, because it can't be manslaughter and reckless murder and felony murder. Uh, but the way in which these jury instructions and law were, were created are part of the problem. But the other part of the problem is uh, what took place in terms of the law itself. So the first big question will be the, the felony murder statute uh, has never had this set of issues presented before the Court of Appeals and the Minnesota Supreme Court, which is can simple if you simply uh, well, according to the government, you don't even have to prove someone intended to cause bodily harm that you can be convicted of, of, of felony murder if someone dies. And you didn't even intend to cause them bodily harm. Seems and, and, like a problem. No, and this is why, you know, Nate Brody was saying this from the beginning. And nobody was really disagreeing that it's strict liability. If you commit a felony, which leads to a death, uh, regardless of what it is, and even if it is the underlying uh, assault itself, you get felony murder in Minnesota because they don't have the merger doctrine. Uh, yeah, they, so th they don't have the merger doctrine, but they've never addressed it in this context before. So they and haven't because, had to really deal with it in, in this context. And the second part of it is they have actually tried to limit the scope of felony murder by saying there has to be a judicial finding and by implication a jury finding that the the crime itself has an inherent risk, serious risk to human life and that in the circumstances present, it had a serious risk to human life. And so the first question is whether the felony murder, that th this is a provision of law that doesn't make sense. Most every other state has rejected it. The common law tradition has rejected it. So now they have to confront it face up. Are they going to allow any murder to be felony murder because it contradicts other Minnesota court doctrines and the long history of felony murder? The second is whether or not he, they made a mistake in the jury instruction on felony murder, both on intentionality and on the question of the what the Minnesota Supreme Court said is you have to make a determination that in the facts of the case, there was a serious risk to human life by the nature of the underlying felony. This was requested as an element uh, in the jury instructions. The judge did not give it. That is also a major question on, on intent issues. And again, these are places where 
the, the government could have been more careful because this jury would have convicted no matter what was in those instructions, given the nature of it. They decided to gamble uh, that that to, to they cared more about getting a verdict, even if it gets overturned down the road. Their, their obsession was verdict now, worry about the appeal tomorrow. Um, so that that's the those are the two questions on felony murder, whether the law itself can apply to these set of circumstances, number one. And number two, whether or not the, uh, in fact, whether that jury instruction should have been changed in the way the defense requested. Okay, now, now here, hypothetically, uh, the, the, the law itself is deemed to be, uh, you know, interpreted against the standard rules of interpretation. So the felony murder charge, let's just say they drop it entirely. He's still convicted on the third degree depraved mind and manslaughter. Does he get sentenced on those or does it go back for an entire new trial if they decide to drop the top charge on which he was convicted? Most likely it gets remanded so solely for sentencing. It's only if the felony murder component of the case had an impact on the jury that could have impacted those other two verdicts, okay. which is not, not likely to, to be determined here. The next question he will have will be, uh, or the next appeal issue he'll have is whether or not reckless murder applies. Because the plain language of the statute and Minnesota Supreme Court law going back over a century said that that third degree reckless murder could only apply when you're doing something dangerous to multiple people, not to a single person. Uh, and so the Court of Appeals decided to ignore that. Uh, and the question will be whether the Minnesota Supreme Court revisits it and actually enforces their rules. There's a very strong legal argument there. Again, the trial court judge himself said it didn't apply initially. It's only the Court of Appeals saying, no, 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 you know, let's railroad this guy that said otherwise. Their, their opinion was frankly ludicrous. Uh, I don't think he'll get relief at the Minnesota Court of Appeals. It's too political. I don't think they're interested in the law. I think they're more interested in politics in this case. But the Minnesota Supreme Court um, really kind of should take it up. Otherwise, they set a precarious precedent for other cases. Then the uh, third issue he has uh, is the uh, on the legal issues, also jury instructions related to those, both intent and causation. So beyond the second degree murder instruction, there's also a third degree murder instruction issue in question. There's also intent and causation areas that were frankly not uh, very clear. And so th those issues have to be resolved because one of the arguments of the defense is that the way causation should be interpreted is that you have to, to be a substantial factor means there can't be, uh, means that the other factors could not have actually uh, caused the death. And it was their interpretation is it has to be the case that, but for the knee, he doesn't die. That if he, that even without the knee, he does die and they have to prove without a reasonable doubt, beyond a reasonable doubt otherwise. And so that causation question and to some degree an intent related question will also go up on that issue as well, because, again, some of the intent instructions were pretty vague uh, and had some contradictory provisions. That's just those issues. Those are all exceptional issues where what would most likely happen in that context is if they uh, they could remand for an entirely new trial or they could remand for sentencing on just manslaughter, which uh, has a top <clears throat> which would radically change his sentencing uh, exposure. The third. Uh, uh, level of issues that he has relates to the venue and sequestration. And that, again, is a very unique set of issues to have. You, you have a the, the, the choice not to move the trial was unusual. In other words, in comparable cases involving high profile political cases where the police officer uh, where it's a police officer involved incident. They have almost always moved the case. They move the Rodney King case. They move the Diallo case. They usually move other cases like that. And so consequently, the fact that they didn't move it uh, will be a major issue. And this will be highlighted by what the same judge does with these other three cops. <clears throat> now, they have stronger arguments and hopefully they'll accumulate better evidence for moving the case. But what does he do? If he do if he moves that trial, it makes it look bad that he didn't move Chauvin. If he doesn't move that trial, it's even more egregious to, to fail to move it. So that 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 will be that we'll see his decision on that will give us a clue about where the court higher courts may go on it. But then if, the if sequestration. They, sorry, no, sorry. It's uh, on the same. Okay, so finish with the sequest. Finish with the sequestration, and then I'll ask the question on the what happens. Sure. So there, are the there's two questions that are present. Should they have been sequestered throughout the trial, and in the same capacity, should they have been instructed not to have any access to the media or social media throughout the trial? The judge chose not to, and then during the trial, there was they were bombarded with all kinds of ne you know negative coverage about Chauvin. Uh, the Minneapolis press talked about it being the most press saturated coverage ever. The judge admitted this, uh, that it was the most press saturated ca case, not only that he had ever been involved in, <clears throat> but that he had ever witnessed, period. 
And then, uh, and then on top of that, that was compounded by the fact that during trial riots occur related to another police shooting where Chauvin is mentioned as part of that. Floyd is mentioned as part of that. And they clearly were witnessing that and seeing that. So that made the, the failure to sequester a bigger problem. Of course, they were also, uh, you know, $27 million ver uh, settlement was announced during jury selection. There's, and even there's so many facts that are that are unique and uh, call it, say, egregious, but just exceptional facts in this case that the, the ongoing riots, you know, Congress making state congressional members making statements, the disclosure of a mass, a record breaking settlement on the eve of the trial. Um, one question, if the trial were moved, would it be, would it be the new judge or a new judge? Would it be it the same judge or a new judge assigned? There's multiple ways that that can happen. He can move it to transfer it to a different judge. He can continue to be the judge, but simply have a different jury pool from a different community and he travel or he even travel to that community. So that can be done multiple different ways. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility the judge has. And so, and they, and there was always risk that you lose the judge, but in this case, you're much better with a better jury pool than keeping the judge. So the, uh, uh, so and then after that, there's the failure to sequester uh, or even uh, void or the jury about the riots that were occurring or about Congresswoman Waters statements or about other politicians statements. And we don't know whether they also heard the president's statements and other people because they decided to talk before they returned their verdict. So the sequestration issue will be a major issue. Usually in a case like this, the jury is sequestered. At a minimum, they're ordered not to look at social media. Uh, <clears throat> and that was not done. Um, and, and he knew this was a problem because so many of the jurors had heard about the settlement. And so if he's, he's saying, well, I told him not to look at anything, but he already voideered him <clears throat> when they were told not to look at anything and they admitted they'd heard about the settlement. So if they'd heard about that, how, how is it they didn't hear about everything else, including riots and congressmen demanding a certain verdict? It's, so it's, we, it's, we haven't had facts this bad since the Sam Shepard case, which was the basis of the TV show, The Fugitive, and then later the movie, The Fugitive. Uh, where Snipes played in the sequel, U.S. Marshals, um, which led to a favorable relationship with the Marshals, by the way. Fascinating <laughs> little historical coincidence. But the uh, that the U.S. Supreme Court recognized venue problems from the media coverage. That's counterbalanced by the Supreme Court's rather preposterous interpretation in the Enron case that said it was fine to do a jury in, in, in Houston when that was just not practicable. Um, but these facts are worse than the Enron case, and they're much more akin to the to the uh, facts in the Sam Shepard case. Plus, it's not just venue is an issue. He could have also expanded the jury pool. He chose not to. He could have also sequestered at multiple times, chose not to. He also could have voideered them about sequestration. He chose not to. And given the alternate juror saying she was bothered by the riots that were ongoing, that shows that he made a mistake in the process. Um, okay, so I mean, like, then what, what would be the outcome? Let's just say that the judge appeal says there was no fair trial, retrial, in a yes. different venue with the broader jury pool, or do they just say, is there, is it possible to say he'll never get a, a fair trial given what's been done? Uh, no, I mean, they'll say that they can always get one. I mean, what learned hand said years ago in, in, in that book was sometimes you can't get a fair trial. So you have to just get stuck with the jury that you can get mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that was this, that's always been the solution. They don't refuse to hold a trial, even if they think every juror everywhere would be biased because that was the reality in the case learned hand was dealing with because it was the trial of communists at the peak of the Cold War, and clearly they couldn't get a fair jury really anywhere. But in this case, uh, they, they would the transfer it most likely to another venue, and I think he could get a much fair and more impartial jury outside of the Minneapolis area. Now, it'll be harder now because of the publicity about conviction to do that, and what it probably means is you have to go to like <clears throat> send out 5,000 juror questionnaires uh, and find the people that aren't tuned into the case. And so the, uh, or, or didn't tune into it much or still willing to be uh, uh, impartial, but at least what you would remove, what was not true anywhere else in many outside of Minneapolis in Minneapolis, they were f fearful for their own community and their own well being. That's not going to be true in Duluth. That's not going to be true in the Fargo area, the Fargo media market of, of Western uh, Northern Minnesota. So that they're not going to be worried about Antifa coming to Fargo town. <clears throat> So and I'm or, referencing or, or really, the, the movie and the TV show. I mean, those are tough folks. They're not going to be worried about that nearly to the degree someone living right through it, driving mm -hmm. through it on a daily basis uh, would be. Um, <clears throat> but that's not all. The, all. the other solution, other appeal issues he has, some big ones, is the failure to allow him to put up the drug dealer and have make the drug dealer take the fifth in front of the jury. 
That's a major issue because that was a potential additional culprit that uh, you know redefined the case. And it's a pure question of law whether he was right about that or not. And then the other one is the uh, in the rebuttal, the prosecution committed multiple acts of uh, prosecutorial misconduct. So it, and under under existing Minnesota Supreme Court precedent, so if they're going to enforce that, the remedy has not been a jury instruction. The remedy is supposed to be mistrial. <clears throat> so I, so those issues. So he has unusually strong evidentiary issues, prosecutorial misconduct issues, venue issues, jury uh, se sequestration issues, jury instruction issues, and legal issues about whether he could even be guilty of the crimes as charged. Okay. Um, so we'll see where, I mean, we'll see. How long does it take to file the appeal? Uh, if there's going to be one, will we know within a week or a month? Oh, well, he's definitely going to appeal. He has appeal as of right to the court of appeals. So they'll have to hear it, but that might take uh, a year, year and a half. Okay. Uh, and then, then the you know, Minnesota Supreme Court, now they don't have to take it. They should, if they're conscientious, but we'll see. Then it could go up to the U S Supreme Court because of the constitutional issues about venue. That, that's a constitutional right that's implicated. The, the felony murder definition may be constitutional, you know, but the bigger one is the venue issue would be the one that could, the Supreme Court might listen to and the sequestration issue because that's, again, constitutional issues. And then it after that, he has habeas rights and he can file that with a federal district court. That goes up to the federal court of appeals. They both have to hear it. So at some point, the Minnesota Court of Appeals and potentially a federal district court and the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals will be hearing the legal matters concerning this case. And the Minnesota Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court may also get involved. And so uh, we'll see. Well, we'll see if, if, if they, I think the great fear is not that he doesn't have strong legal merits for his appeal. The great fear is that the case is so hot and so political that the kind of cowardly courts we have these days will take the same kind of action they've taken in the lockdown context, which is to find a desk to hide under. So, uh, Time will tell whether they do what's uh, right. Because, again, it's the justice system itself and the American justice system that's really on trial here. Okay. Now, people are voting, and I think I missed what they're voting about. One last question before we move on. Can you briefly exp explain the merger doctrine? Because I know that I will destroy it if I try to explain it. Sure. So what is this felony murder is supposed to be? You go out and commit a, a really dangerous felony, and in the process of it, somebody dies. And they want to tag. I've never been in favor of felony murder, period. My view is use other. I don't think felony murder should exist. But when felony murder started in the English common law, it was limited to very, very few cases because generally there weren't many felonies. We've dramatically expanded the number of charges that can be felonies. And so the way the courts have dealt with that while still keeping the felony murder rule. And again, in Minnesota, they recognize all they did was codify in, in law, the common law doctrine. And so uh, was to uh, make sure that it could not apply to just any felony. So that's why, for example, in Minnesota, they've said if you're uh, if you kill someone in the middle of a sexual assault, you cannot be charged with felony murder. If you commit if you kill someone in a drive by shooting, you cannot be convicted in felony murder. Uh, the and that comes from various decisions they've made over time. You, if you if someone dies during a drug deal, you can't be killed. You can't be charged with felony murder. That's what makes it ridiculous that this charge mm -hmm. somehow you could be. Um, and that's why they really like the, the interpretation that felony murder has been clearly interpreted to be anything. That's not in the Minnesota case law. That's just in a, the Minnesota case law's failure to address these problems in an anticipatory manner. The way most courts have resolved this is they've said you can't have a the, the felony murder can't be the murder itself. It has to be a different, separate felony and it cannot merge into the murder. In other words, it's, if it's the same felony, then it's not felony murder period. I, the I mean, context I, in which it first came up in Minnesota was unique. And the con and the reason why they rejected the merger rule is it wasn't presented the way I'm talking about. It was presented as, as this kind of assault should never be considered felony merger, murder because of the uh, merger rule. And that's why they rejected it way back you know, 30 years ago. There was not me meaningful thought given to it. Uh, so that's why the Minnesota courts have never really thought through the implications. There's no decision in the Minnesota that says you can charge any murder as felony murder, but that's how it was applied in the Chauvin case. And mm -hmm. that's why it presents that question. The most courts have come up with a solution of simply saying the only way to really solve this is to adopt the murder, the merger rule. If we adopt the merger rule, we don't have to deal with this. Minnesota and, has adopted other rules that say you have to charge the you can only be sentenced to the least pro, the least lowest level of sentence if the elements are the same. They've said that uh, you have to have this special risk to human life inherent in the crime and as applied to the facts. But it, th those weren't even applied here. 
So uh, the either they're going to reinforce those old rules to say felony murder didn't apply here or adopt the merger rule, which is the way almost every other court has in the country. OK, and that, and that makes sense. And that's just to avoid that every manslaughter becomes felony murder if the underlying felony itself was the was the act or was the assault. Well, you even have to have a higher level of intent, according to the government's argument and closing argument. You have to have a higher level of intent for the lowest level of manslaughter than you do for felony murder. Yeah. And, and that we, we've, we've mentioned that. That's the absurdity. Now, you know, other people's argument is going to be, yes, it's the absurdity, but it's the law. We'll see if it gets interpreted. But accordingly. It, it, it really can't be that, though, because you're interpreting a statute. And under the one <clears throat> canon of statutory construction is that you can never interpret the law to create an absurd consequence. So I get people are saying, hey, look, the existing case law allows for this to happen, but that's only because they haven't addressed this question head on. Because otherwise you're saying the legislature intended an absurd uh, result, and that violates the biggest canon of statutory construction that exists. I just want everyone to appreciate how beautiful that term is, canon of statutory construction for the most boring concept ever of interpreting the law. Um, okay, well, that's it. Let's move on because we've done a, we've we've thoroughly gone through this I don't think you'll find any better analysis and coverage of this trial than here. Robert Gruler, Nate Brody, Uncivil Law, a bunch of the other guys, but here in particular. Uh, we'll see where it goes, and we'll be on it whenever there's developments.